Hey everyone, so for today we're going to be looking at the Civil War, the conflict between the Northern and Southern states, between the Union and the Confederacy. Uh, this conflict began in 1861 and would last four years and completely change the country and will be up to this day still the bloodiest, most destructive war in American history. So the furnace of war really changed and forged the American country. Um, the country was t completely torn apart by this, obviously fighting each other. Um, but war was a refining fire that fundamentally changed the U.S. It altered the balance between state and national government, it redefined race relations, and everyday life gave way to extreme situations that forged heroes and villains. Let's look at a couple individual stories from the war, a couple stories of people who fought in the war. The story of George H. Giddens. Giddens was a Confederate soldier who led a group of Confederate soldiers in an attack on Union troops in Brownsville, Texas. This was actually the last battle of the war, but it occurred one month after General Robert E. Lee had surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. The war was over. The soldiers knew the war was over, but attacked simply out of spite, and they killed over 30 people in this attack. Let's look at the individuals who were on the steamboat Sultana. The Sultana was a steamboat that had been designed to carry 375 passengers. It was loaded with 2,427 people. This is following the war. 2,100 of which were prisoners of war. So the war is over. They're going back home. Um, the boilers blew up on the ship, and the ship sank quickly, killing 1,800 people. So the war is over, and yet there's still devastation occurring. Thomas Osborne was a major in the Union Army. During Sherman's march through the South, he commanded his troops to burn every single building as they marched from Georgia through South Carolina. He killed the residents and torched homes and towns for over 60 miles laying complete waste to these towns throughout the South. We also get the idea of the horrors of war and the devastation to individuals with the story of Abraham Huck. Huck was a pioneer in Kansas. Um, his family, as a result of the war, was starving to death. Um, so he was searching for food one day, and here's a quote about a man who found Huck. He was literally clothed in rags. His garments, originally homespun, had been patched with so many different materials that the feeble threads would no longer hold together, and the shreds were flopping about him as he walked. His face was haggard and hunger-worn, cheekbones protruded, flesh had sunk away, and his eyes were hollow and starved. Um, Huck, like many others, was starving as a result of the war. Uh, war was completely devastating to the country. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Confederate commander. Um, he ambushed Fort Pillow when Fort Pillow was in the uh, was surrendering under a white flag. They were waving the white flag as a truce. Um, he slaughtered almost 300 Union soldiers who surrendered. His men did, um, and he buried many of these men alive. You can see the horror of this, the devastation of the war. Um, Forrest would actually go on after the war to become the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. The war also devastated families. It tore apart families. Uh, here's the story of John J. Jackson. John J. Jackson was Stonewall Jackson's cousin. Stonewall Jackson is the famous Confederate general. Um, John J. led Parkersburg in seceding from Virginia. Uh, so they seceded from the state to join the Union. Um, and he is quoted saying, we are deeply convicted that our national prosperity, our hopes of happiness and future security depend on preserving the union as it is. We will not abandon what we regard as the best government ever. Um, so you can see two cousins split. One is leading, leaving Virginia, joining the union. The other one is one of the most famous generals of the Confederate army, tearing families apart. One of the good aspects of the Civil War was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was a benevolent president. He was one of our greatest presidents. Um, Lincoln led the country triumphantly during the war and was able to reconnect the Union through the victory. Um, so his story is Lincoln visited Richmond one day after it fell at the end of the war. He freed, freed slaves, fell to their knees and kissed his feet told them to kneel only to God. Don't kneel to him. He's a mere mortal. Um, in response to General Wetzel's question about how to treat the Confederate soldiers and residents, Lincoln responded, if I were in your place, I'd let 
I'd let them up easy. This means that Lincoln looked to the other side, looked at the people who had been at war at, and saw them as his fellow countrymen again. Um, and he wanted to reconnect. If there had been a worse president, a more sinister president, we probably would not have survived the Civil War. As we saw in our other lectures, the nation was moving towards war. Um, you can see here the paper from February of 1861, just showing no compromise, no concession to traitors. The Constitution as it is, basically saying there will be no more compromises. This has gone to the brink. Um, this is months before the shots are fired at Fort Sumter. And the Thurlow Brown, who was a newspaper man, kind of summed up the conflict. Now, this is not a temporary skirmish between Republicans and Democrats. This, but a deadly struggle between freedom and the most despotic system of human bondage that now disgraces the world. Uh, 500,000 Northerners joined the state militias prior to Fort Sumter. Um, so Northerners were preparing for war even before shots were fired. No one expected it to be in short and easy war though. Um, a Michigan newspaper was quoted as saying, we have fed the Southerner whiners with sugar plums long enough. There must be bloodletting. This war will last but a short time. It is a long overdue for us to teach the South a lesson. Northern soldiers only enlisted for 90 days. You can see a um, call to arms here, soldiers enlisting. They thought they would go to war quickly. The powerful United States would quickly quell this rebellion. You can see kind of the idea of war as it's starting off. Um, here's people on the Charleston Harbor. This is a depiction from the London news of the shots fired at Fort Sumter in April of 1861. You can see people in their best dress. They're standing there watching the shots fired as if it's like a fireworks show. People expected this to be short. They didn't expect a long, bloody conflict that would happen. And this can be seen in the Battle of First Bull Run or First Manassas. Um, the truth kind of really sinks in at Bull Run. Residents of Washington, D.C. went to the battlefield to picnic and watch the soldiers fight. This is going to be a grand, um, grand time. This is the first major battle of the war. Um, the people ride out, they bring their picnics, they get up on the hill, they're going to watch people fight. Um, they were confident that it would be a quick and exciting event. However, as it, things progressed, uh, the South quickly turned the tides and was able to defeat the Union Army. And a lot of these people who had come were caught in the fighting. Uh, once the fighting ended, there were 4,900 dead and wounded. It was a very bloody battle in which the South wins. And this kind of shows all these people that, wow, the South actually might have a fight and this might not be the short war the spectator event that we thought it would be the what happened at bull run was a preview of what would happen it was a devastating conflict the civil war lasted four years until 1865 it was a long drawn-out conflict that exhausted and drained both sides and it left 620,000 americans dead as we all know the north did eventually win the conflict um, it was able to overcome the rebellion of the South. Um, and some of the reasons for that is that the industry, stuff we've talked about in the North was so far superior. They had 86% of the factories in the United States. They had 97% of the firearms production. Uh, so 97%, the South only had 3% of the gun production. Uh, the free male population, 18 to 20, those who will be fighting in the war, they had 81% of those, and they had 71% of the railroad mileage. So they had more factories, more soldiers, more railroads to uh, get goods to and from the front. And they also had Abraham Lincoln, who was one of the greatest uh, leaders, one of the greatest presidents that this country has ever had. The Southern Strait lied in several things. One of the most important one was their military leadership. Uh, the South was led by Robert E. Lee, and other generals like Stonewall Jackson, who were extremely capable and who led great victories like the victory at First Bull Run. Um, so these generals were able to outsmart and outwit a lot of the generals that were for the Union Army, that um, the Union Army actually had really weak generals up until they got to Ulysses S. Grant. So the first general of the Union Army was General George McClellan. McClellan um, he came up with a peninsula campaign was basically was to land at the mouth of the James River. Um, and this is in March of 1862, push all the way to Richmond. Richmond is the capital of the Confederacy. He had 6,000 troops versus 13,000 troops in Williamsburg when they landed. Um, they had 100,000 troops versus 60,000 in Richmond. 
but he only advanced he advanced within six miles of Richmond before retreating. Um, Lincoln was quoted saying McClellan had a case of the slows. McClellan was infamous infamous for taking time. He would not make quick movements. He was taking his time in the Peninsula campaign, and this allowed him to be outsmarted and defeated by the better Confederate generals. McClellan's leadership would affect him again with a case of the slows in the Battle of Antietam. So what happened following his defeat in the Peninsula campaign, uh, Robert E. Lee it tries to take the offensive to the Union. He moves into Maryland, and the Union and the Confederates meet at the Battle of Antietam. McClellan has a superior force and actually beats Robert E. Lee, pushes him back out of Maryland at, at Antietam. Um, and he could have followed the retreating Confederates and won the war, but he didn't. He had many excuses. He had exhausted troops, broken cannons, tired horses, unfamiliar terrain, not enough food, too few blankets, the river was deep, etc. McClellan just wasn't the general to win the war for the Union. Wild card in the conflict was Great Britain. You know, Great Britain at this point is a huge world power, um, and Great Britain depended on southern cotton. They depended on those exports from the south, and so the government of Great Britain actually wanted the Confederates to win, but they were also afraid to openly declare war against the Union. They didn't want to have an open war, um, so they kind of slyly assisted some Confederate efforts. Um, they actually never declared. The, that the Confederacy was a separate country, um, but they did help out in smaller ways. So you look at the CSS Alabama, uh, this is a Confederate warship. It was actually manned by British seamen, people who had come over to help the Confederate effort, and it destroyed 65 Union ships. So Lincoln really comes to the rescue yet again. Lincoln is the great leader of the Civil War. Um, and what Lincoln does is realize that if Great Britain joins the war, they could be in huge trouble. Um, and so he actually issues in January of 1863, the famous document, the Emancipation Proclamation, basically turning this from a war about states' rights into a war of emancipation, a war against slavery. And one of the reasons he did this, um, Lincoln didn't start the war to free the slaves. He started the war to keep the Union together. Um, but he knew that the idea of supporting slavery would keep Great Britain out of the war. Um, and so this became a key aspect of the war. So this really stopped Britain from intervening in the war and joining the South. Um, what it also does, the Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves, is open up a lot of free people, a lot of slaves who have left their masters, um, and allows them to enter the Union Army. Um, these slaves were known as contraband, um, in the South, and when uh, when the Union would attack different forts, they would get a huge group of slaves who are no longer slaves now. They're freed. And so Lincoln declares that all slaves um, are freed slaves in areas of rebellion. So areas that are rebellion, they are no longer slaves. They are freemen. And what this allows them to do is join the Union Army. So 180,000 African Americans fought with the Union forces in the Civil War. Lincoln was also willing to go to certain extremes to win the war. Um, he violated the Constitution in certain ways by suspending voting rights. He suspended certain freedoms of speech. Um, and he also suspended the right of habeas corpus, which is the means that you have to be charged with a crime before being arrested. They could arrest people, lock them up without charging them for crime. But Lincoln sums this up in this quote. He says, life and limb must be protected. Often a limb must be amputated to save a life, but a life is never wisely given to save a limb. I felt that unconstitutional measures were necessary to preserve the Constitution and preserve the nation. So basically saying in the case of war, he felt it necessary to suspend these constitutional rights in order to save the Constitution as a whole. Lincoln also lays out his great vision for America. He lays out the Gettysburg Address following the Battle of Gettysburg, which we'll talk about. Um, but then he reiterates the fact that all men are created equal. This means all men, not just white men, um, that the Constitution needs to stand for more than this. Um, and he states that the government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. So he's really kind of trying to say in the middle of this war, saying that the Constitution will stand. These ideals still matter. So this was the bloodiest war in American history. Um, obviously, it was fought a Americans against Americans. 
And we'll look at a couple of the key battles right now and why it was such a devastating war. The war began at Fort Sumter when Confederate soldiers fired on a Union base on Fort Sumter, the island base. Um, Charleston had to take the fort due to its position in the harbor to the head of the Charleston Harbor. Um, it was a 34-hour bombardment. There were actually no casualties during the bombardment. There were two casualties during the evacuation the following days. Uh, two Union soldiers died trying to evacuate the fort. But General Beauregard fired on his West Point professor, Major Anderson. Both of the people went to um, West Point. So you can see just the conflict. This is you know, people who went to college together firing on each other. Um, and that's how the country was torn apart. But really, this was a political test case. Um, what would Lincoln do and how would Lincoln allow the South to secede? The Battle of Antietam happened in September 1862. Um, this battle occurs after the Peninsula Campaign, when McClellan is defeated by Lee, pushed out of the South. And what General Lee, General Robert E. Lee, decides to do is move into the Union state of Maryland in a hope of demoralizing the North, um, resupplying his troops, and kind of convincing Britain to win the war, showing Britain they're powerful, they can go in and win victories in the North. Uh, but this is actually the first Northern victory, as I talked about earlier in the lecture. McClellan and his superior forces defeated the Confederates, pushed them out of Maryland, pushed them back. Uh, but this led to the Emancipation Proclamation. This is after this battle uh, Lincoln declares that this is now a fight for, for freedom, for slavery, to end slavery. Um, but what had happened is the Union actually discovered Lee's battle plans lying on the ground wrapped around three cigars. So they had Lee's plan of attack because Lee was a tactical genius. Um, he won every battle up to this point against uh, superior forces, but they discovered his battle plans and were able to turn the tides. The Battle of Gettysburg is the largest battle in American history. Um, it is also the turning point of the war. After this battle, the chance of the Confederacy winning the war is almost gone. Um, so what happens is General Lee leads his Confederate army into Pennsylvania, again in an attempt to demoralize the North, but also he is trying to reach Washington, D.C. and capture the capital of the Union, basically win the war that way. Um, so the two armies meet in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, um, and it is a three-day battle that leaves 46,000 people dead. Um, the battle ends in a famous or infamous charge known as Pickett's Charge. Lee ordered his troops on the last day of battle to march a fortified hill where General uh, George Meade's Union Army was dug in. Uh, Twenty, there's so twelve. 1,500 Confederate troops marched across an open field into grape shot and broke apart at point blank range. So one of the big things that happens in the Civil War is there's a big advancement in military technology. Um, and so what grape shot is, is basically like a shotgun that goes into a um, cannon and shoots out and sprays all over the field. And the Union position was completely fortified on a hill. Uh, so these men are walking, marching across an open field into a bunch of fire, into a bunch of cannon fire. Um, they also have rifled, um, rifled ammunition now. So the the ammunition travels farther, travels faster. So it's just deadlier warfare, um, and that's what you really see at Gettysburg. So this is the complete turning point of the war. The the defeat at Gettysburg, um, the Confederate defeat, really will be the last major battle um, where they have a chance of winning the war. Following Gettysburg. The Union really tries to put the pressure on the South to end the war. Um, they've pushed them out. They've defeated them. Now they're going to try to crush their spirit. And this is what happens with Union General William T. Sherman's uh, famous march to the sea in the winter of 1864. So what happens is 60,000 Union troops march 285 miles from Atlanta to Savannah across Georgia. And the goal of this was to frighten the South and shatter its morale. Um, but they burned and destroyed farms on the way, uh, rail lines, towns, everything. You can see a depiction of it, basically just to destroy the South. Um, this is trying to convince the South to give up the fight. Um, and Sherman's tactics were brutal but effective. The war ends at Appomattox in April of 1865, so after four long years. Lee surrenders to Ulysses S. Grant, um, and the Civil War ends.
The Union actually fed hungry Confederates and allowed them to keep their weapons. Lee responded by ordering his troops to peacefully return to their homes and rejoin the country as Americans. So the Union, Lee has been running from Grant's army and finally meets at Appomattox and realizes it's over. Um, Appomattox is right up the road in 460, uh, Route 460, um, about an hour and a half from here. If you have your chance to go check it out, it's kind of cool. A look at life during the war. Let's see what it was like for the people who fought at the war. Definitely difficult times at home, not just for the men fighting the war, but for the people in the South and the people who would suffer. So there were actually riots, bread riots in Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of Confederacy. What happens is the Union controlled most of the countryside around Richmond. Uh, so rail traffic was largely cut off. Speculators drove the price of food. And so women gathered at Belvedere Baptist Church to organize protest, told to bring hammers, guns, knives, and axes. They're going to protest the price of food. Mary Walker is described as a toothless old woman with a determined fist. She broke into a warehouse with an axe and stole 500 pounds of bacon. Over 3,000 women rioted through the, out, through the city, looting stores and taking food, jewelry, and linen. So you see the women left at home have been suffering. They're angry, and they riot in their own town in Richmond. President of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, actually addressed the crowd, trying to calm the rioters, trying to calm the people who are rioting for food. Um, but the women of the riot actually screamed at him, bread, the union, and no more starvation, saying, the fight's over. We just want to eat. We don't want to starve for this cause anymore. So you can see the suffering that is affected by all people in this war. But they also tried to keep the story kind of quiet. They didn't want people to know about this, that, that the, their city, their capital was in um, revolt. So trying to keep the story quiet, the Richmond Examiner described the incident as prostitutes, professional thieves, Irish and Yankee hags, gallows birds from all lands, egged on by traitors and Yankee spies. Basically saying these are scum, these aren't people of Richmond, these aren't the good people of Richmond, these are egged on by spies, they're traitors. Another example of difficult times at home. The story of Champ Ferguson. Um, so what happens is guerrilla war was waged in the backcountry throughout the South, especially in Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri. So that is uh, small bands of rebels, small bands of Confederates would hit and run um, and hide in their land. You know, the, one of the big advantages that the South has is they are fighting on home train. They know the train. We saw all this in the Revolutionary War. Champ Ferguson was really good at this guerrilla warfare. He actually killed 53 men described his conflict as this we were having sort of a miscellaneous war up there through Fentress County Tennessee and Clinton County Kentucky each of us had 20 or 30 prescribed enemies and it was regarded as legitimate to kill them at any time at any place under any circumstances um, so basically saying that he's gonna wage war any way he can against the Union Ferguson actually killed William Frog, who was a neighbor and friend, for going to a Union recruitment center. Frog was sick and in bed at the time. Ferguson simply drew his pistol and shot Frog twice in front of his wife and child, killing him on the spot. And then he ransacked the cabin looking for weapons. Um, this shows how bloody the conflict got, how people were openly murdering each other as a result of the Civil War. Ferguson's killing went farther than that. Uh, Ferguson killed Reuben Wood for sympathizing with the Union. He shot him on his front porch. Um, when he showed up, he said, don't you beg and don't you dodge. Wood's wife and daughter actually pleaded for his life while the old man himself reminded his visitor, why champ, I have nursed you. Has there ever been any misunderstanding between us? This which Ferguson replied to as no Reuben, you have always treated me like a gentleman, but I intend to kill you. Ferguson is killing his neighbors in the name of war. Um, it is tearing the country apart. Wars didn't end after the war. Um, it was a difficult homecoming for many people. Victims of wounds, uh, post-traumatic stress. Uh, so here's an example of that with Taylor Pierce. Pierce was afraid that he was going to struggle to transition back to civilian life. He had been an officer in the Union Army. Now he's quoted saying, now that the war is over, will I be in a situation to enjoy what I've striven for? Basically saying, I fought this war. Now what am I going to get from it? The 42-year-old was suffering from hearing loss, a damaged spine, hemorrhaging bowels, and various throbs and aches. He had been severely wounded in the war um, and it's affecting him every day of his life.
Pierce was able to find temporary positions buying livestock for a butcher and operating engines, but he struggled with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and was often so angry and tense that he could not even converse with people. He lost his job and struggled with poverty as his health deteriorated. What you're seeing in these pictures are amputees and men who had been wounded in the Civil War following the war. Pierce's daughter wrote about him. I don't believe he has had a day since he came home without more or less suffering. Um, basically saying that Pierce fighting for the war continues to suffer. The war never ended for him. And you can see a picture here of a man who lost both his hands in the Civil War. So for him, how does the war ever end? There was violence outside of the war as well. In 1863, a riot broke out in New York City when the white population targeted African Americans in the city for about four days. White workers were convinced that those who were being drafted would lose their jobs to African Americans being freed in the South. That they would come up and take their jobs while they were fighting. Uh, a lot of these people were immigrants coming straight to the United States and then being drafted. And this is a quote from the newspaper time. Any black person caught in the mob's path was clubbed, stabbed, hanged, or burned. And in some cases, a combination of all four. Many of the male victims were sexually mutilated and their toes or fingers cut off for trophies. In all, 3,000 African Americans lost their home. This is a tragic situation in New York. African Americans were also treated horribly as POWs. You have to thank those black soldiers fighting for the Union who were captured by Confederate soldiers were to be put to death or otherwise punished. So they weren't treated as um, other prisoners of war. They were treated as lesser than that, as they had been. Many of these POWs were re-enslaved. And there was actually a quote unquote Negro squad at Anderson prison camp um, in the South where they were kept. Um, so you could see here the bounty for colored men, um, to, you know, how horrible this is. And overall, the Civil War tore the country apart. Um, it was a devastating conflict for all people involved. Um, the war completely changed the country and continues to have lasting effects even to this day.